Today's session is uh, by Husab and Eden Turkey. He's a research assistant in biomedical informatics and library and information science at uh, Data Engineering and Semantics Research Team in the Faculty of Sciences of uh, Sfax University in Tunisia. Uh, he's also a medical student at the Faculty of Sciences of Sfax and an open science advocate and a long-term Wikimedian, Wikimedian, if I'm saying that right. <laughs> and his main fields of interest are the development of tools for scholarly research evaluation and the creation of linked data applications for clinical medicine and health decision support. Welcome, Husam Adin, and I'm very glad to have you on. So thank you for having me today. The main focus on of this presentation is not the creation of semantic annotations, but wh why we do semantic annotations. For information, we are an international team of many of uh, Wikidata users from all over the world who are working on uh, many aspects of COVID-19 information raising from computer science to me clinical medicine, genetics, etc. Etc. Et Concerning the University of Sfax, we have a research group specialized in uh, semantic technology and biomedical data science, the group I belong to. And we have a techno park working on R and D uh, uh, stuff related to computer science. So, as you already know, the COVID 19 is a huge data set of scholarly papers made crowdsourcing of many publishers, Titan, etc., etc. It includes the title, the abstract, the keywords, the full text, etc. And all this information is growing every day. So to track this huge amount of data of raw text, we are we need a lot of human resources. And even if we have lots of human resources, it is difficult to process by humans. It is also the difficult to process by computer programs without any pre-processing. And that's why the many people have proposed to build a knowledge graph for, from these publications to represent COVID-19 information in a fully structured way. This means that the structure that the, the COVID-19 information will be converted to the to RDF triples representing the sum of all that we know about COVID-19. And as it is represented in the form of RDF triples, it can re read by humans and by machines, and it can be easily findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the data model can be flexible. It can, we can have new properties, new items in an easier way. And the most important feature is that it can be screened using a query language called SparkQL. So Wikidata, well, Wikidata is a large scale free knowledge base. It is available at uh, www.wikidata.org. Item and properties are assigned language independent identifier and labels as shown on the right. And they are also assigned labels and descriptions in multiple languages. The items and properties are assigned statements in the form of triples. These triples are involving subject, which is the item, of uh, properties that somehow represent the type of the statement. It is shown in red. And the object that is represented in blue. It can also involve qualifiers explaining in more detailed way the statement and references given the source of that property, of that uh, statement, I mean. Statements can be relational, taxonomic and non-taxonomic, and non-relational one. 
such as value, uh, object as value, external ID, URLs, dates, etc. And that's mainly the definition of knowledge graph and its difference from uh, ontologies and taxonomies. Okay. The main fe other feature, and it is useful, is the CC0 license. The Wikidata information can be used without any barrier from the legal side. But this, this license, waiving all kind of copyrights, can be a barrier to, for inclusion to all, for other, uh, that, uh, for involvement other data sets released under other licenses that are not waiving the attribution pattern. For example, for example, the CC BY. Okay, what's the difference between the, the collaborative and multidisciplinary knowledge graph I'm proposing and that can be added and modified and curated by everybody? He has just to take an account and uh, modify things. And between the specialized knowledge graph, like the CORD 19 NEKJ. Okay, the difference is that it includes uh, the collaborative multidisciplinary logic graph include other information that are not related at all to COVID-19 because it involves information ev even before the pandemic. And so it can allow correlation analysis between COVID-19 information and non-COVID-19 information, for example, the, the number of new cases versus, for example, the population, the number of deaths versus the population density, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we can make use of data models already existing. For example, we have, uh, for example, for Zika, the representation of, uh, for example, the cases, the deaths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We can make use of it and adapt it to COVID-19. And it can be edited and curated by a large community of editors that have it. We're concerned with the specialized knowledge graph. It does, it, it only includes ava ava available information about COVID-19. So it can uh, allow only the deep analysis of COVID-19 information and not the integration of non with non-COVID-19 information. The data model as well, are developed from scratch, which is a waste of time, et cetera, et cetera. And is edited and curated by a panel of experts, so small people that take time to update things. The, the information is growing every day and this can be a barrier against the lifelong uh, enrichment of the knowledge graph. Okay, so let's talk about methods. How can we create a large scale knowledge graph in Wikidata about COVID-19. So there are five tasks here. The task one is creating a data model for COVID-19 knowledge graph. The second task is analyzing COVID-19 research publications using a variety of way that we will explain in a few seconds. The third task is the addition of COVID-19 items to the knowledge graph. The task number four is the update of the data model for COVID-19. And the five is the validation of existing COVID-19 information. So concerning the task two and the task four, you see that as we go in further and in more depth, in analyzing the COVID-19 research publications, we find new concepts and new types of information that can be relevant for COVID-19 inform uh, formation. And that requires the data model to be lively updated. So we should analyze the publications, update the data model, and then apply to the the, the analysis of COVID-19 research publications, et cetera, et cetera. So the, so the same thing uh, applies 
to uh, the validation process. The validation process is a lively process because when you include a new statement, it can contradict an existing information, an assumption. And so you have to update that assumption that become uh, somehow obsolete. Okay, so the creation of the data model. Well, we use shakes for the representation of the shape, kind of shape structure of the information that should be linked to the item uh, that are involved in each class. We should also define the class because we should see what are the types of items that we are covering. We should add and sustain properties to characterize COVID-19 information. And that's somehow what CORD19 NEKG has done. I'm sharing with you the link, you can see it. And there is a YouTube presentation in uh, a previous edition of this meeting uh, made by uh, Mr. Frank Michel. Okay. The second task is the analysis of CORD19 research publications. Well, the first step and more intuitive than one is the human screening screening of CORD19 research publications using Symantec Scholar, PubMed Central, etc. for the creation of statements. We are just searching the web and uh, finding new information and add, adding it with the references manually. The second one is the analysis of the CORD19 research publications using the APIs. And we have now two main Python libraries for that. It is the Semantic Scholar one, which is made to process Semantic Scholar API, and the PO Python that processes PubMed Central. Okay. The third key method for analyzing CORD19 research publications is the annotation process. We should annotate the CORD19 research publications with named entities from Symantec database such, such as Wikidata. We should eliminate st stop words, extract n-grams, and find the n-grams in knowledge graphs using the APIs. Okay, the annotation process can be co contextualized because we can restrict it. For example, we will annotate only drugs or we can annotate only diseases, etc., etc. So that's an uh, annotation tool. It is not mine. It is one use, uh, that uses uh, the UMLS metadesires. It is multivac, and it annotates a uh, kind of concepts using a taxonomy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it annotates it with the, its a class and kind of represented in a user user friendly uh, interface okay the second type of uh, annotating concepts uh, and uh, finding them in uh, core 19 research publications is the use of topic modeling and mainly the latent dirichlet allocation Okay, we can use it to retrieve the main concepts and using the co-occurrence, we can find the, some kinds of relations, but the development of methods based on that are still uh, in its beginning. Well, the redundancy of returned concepts, for example, this, I mean the synonyms or the closely related ones, for example, hypernyms, eponyms, etc., etc., can be solved using word similarity metrics such as the semantic similarity measures or the word embeddings. Okay. The third concept, kind of the fourth concept, I mean, is the annotation with semantic databases, with the relations from semantic databases using Wikidata. It is the annotations not of items, 
but of relations. Okay, so the there are various methods of that. There are the human screen and annotation of the relation using a tool such as the Pratt. The use of the, the benchmark of semantic relations of the same type using, for example, drug interactions, drug disease relations. These are the main ones that exist already here. And, and we use ML techniques, for example, conventional neural networks, the recurrent neural networks, et cetera, et cetera, or web embeddings were to vect BERT ELMO to annotate and retrieve the semantic relations from CORD 19. And we can infer it from topic modeling, as I said before. Okay. So to infer and to extract relations and annotate them we, we, within the text, we should have kind of data model to represent these semantic relations in the text. So there are two main uh, data models for that. The first one is the subject or action target re and relation model. This model uses a number of like of uh, generic types of uh, properties to represent the link between the annotated items. For example, 13 or 14 in the maximum. They are not as seen in each type of uh, biomedical relations uh, kind of label. And they are annotating the action relating between the subject or and the target as a, as a, an item, like as shown here in red. So here, red is the action, and the arrow here it represents its subject, and here its object. So the type of relation is the that he uh, that the SARS-CoV-2 infects the humans here. That's the main uh, <clears throat> the main uh, outcome of such of such uh, annotation. Well, the advantage of such an annotation is that it can it can be used to annotate any type of relation because the the relation are are annotated within the text we are just uh, infer uh, we are just the and the action so we are annotating it as an action and that's all we can annotate an infinity of relations as it exists as if they exist in the text well, the disadvantage is the determinations of how action can be annotated within the text. For example, here, causing, should, should we annotate it as an action or not? For example, uh, uh, well, here, infects or that infects is the action. So we have some, some limitations in that. The second data model is the subject object relation annotation. Well, every type of biomedical relations is re represented by relation type. Only identified concepts are annotated in the analyzed text. That this meant that the, the, the terms that represent the relation type are not annotated at all. And as you see in the example, you have the, the subject that is linked by the, uh, to the object by an arrow, and the arrow is tagged by the relation type. And that's all. Well, the problem with this type of annotation is that we can, for example, mistakenly annotate the relations that is not 
the represented by the sentence. May, for example, if there is in uh, in a, in a, an ontology that SARS-CoV-2 is different from COVID-19, and if the sentence says that SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19, so the the different from relations is not the relation type that is meant to be represented there. And that's the main problem of that. Medin, I have a question. Is that okay to ask? Yes. This? Um, yeah, if you could back up to that slide or the one before. Um, which, in, in those diagrams where you show arrows, I'm, I'm trying to map my understanding to RDF triples. So which of those would become triples? Does, does each of those arrows represent a triple in, in, the res in a resulting? The, this is not Wikidata. This is the annotation. But yes. OK. Yes, there, there are uh, NDF triples because this concept is a and concept. It is in the form of triples. So they are represented as a triples. And, and also the red ones, the subject one? Yes. And target it is also? The action, subject, and concept. OK, so those are all triples, all of those dotted arrows then. OK. Yes. But the way they represent the triples is different from the two examples. And that's the example worth the study. Well, we are mainly struggling with that now. OK. Thank you. So, one last like uh, method to uh, to infer relations and add it to Wikidata is the use of the biometric enhanced information retrieval. For example, we can use the mesh keywords. For example, hepatitis C therapy and suppose we have therapeutic use in this publications can determine that the bosphivir is used as a drug for hepatitis C. So we have now uh, plenty of keywords for COVID-19 publications that are included in PubMed. We can use all these terms using related Dirichlet allocation to build kind of graph with uh, a good uh, accuracy. This, the second one is the publication type. Well, when we are working with literature reviews and more precisely, the encyclopedic reviews, the titles of sections represent uh, kind of uh, uh, types of relations. For example, if we are talking about an article about a drug, for example, acetromycin, the paragraph entitled drug interactions include the drug interactions of acetromycin. Well, that's all for what of the techniques of analysis uh, of uh, COVID-19 scholarly publications. So now we have the relations and we need to add it to Wikidata. What we can do? Well, we can create a new item using this link or create a new statements. We can add a new value, you can, we can add the reference, we can edit you in the friendly, in the user-friendly interface of Wikidata. So we can also use the API. We can mass extract COVID-19 multidisciplinary information and we can adjust and modify the information as well using the API. It is simple and with the And we have another tool, which is called Quick Statements. We just add the triples in the form of CSV file, and we send it to this file, and it adds it uh, all the information, all the new information as batches, as you see here. And this tool can be programmatically used by uh, Python programs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, it has an API itself. 
Okay, and we have the Wikidata integrator uh, library that is the Wikidata a library that can extract entities from Wikidata. It can add entities to Wikidata and it can even adjust some statements and information. For example, the labels, the description, etc. So to apply for a bot on Wikidata, so yeah, you have decided that the, you are we will be using these uh, tools to build uh, kind of Python programs to enrich Wikidata. So you need to apply for kind of bot flag, which is which is a permission to use the bot and apply it to Wikidata because not anyone can vandalize Wikidata and right uh, it's stuff uh, without uh, consensus among the community so we have you have to share the python code in the github repository and then make a request as shown here and then you have a discussion here we are you are you need to provide the code and do you have to explain what is the function and then after that they can approve it for you as shown here and you can run it on the server and it can consequently automatically urge and adjust wikidata information about covid19 or other stuff okay one in other interesting feature of wikidata is that it is linked to other open datasets and knowledge graphs these knowledge graphs are included in the linked open data cloud and they are automatically extracting COVID-19 information from COVID-19 dataset. And what we, we do is that we, we just infer this, this relation, these relations and adding it to Wikidata because all of the items are aligned, etc. Okay, well, the data model, concerning the data model. Well, concerning the data model, many methods are available for updating it. Well, you can use SparkQL to, uh, to extract new features of the class. Well, you can uh, new, New you can use the information you have picked from other resources to somehow see how the data works. And finally, you can work on this, on the Shakes validation schema. This Shakes validation schema defines the shape of uh, kind of, of the data model for uh, a given class. So all we have here are triples like this. You have here the, the types. Each type is, uh, is assigned a different sign. For example, literal, it's right literal and with asterisk, et cetera, et cetera. The item is point asterisk, et cetera. Well, we have for uh, concerning the validation of existing COVID-19 information. Well, we have first the property constraint and statements. The statements are uh, assigned somehow kind of formatting conditions, etc., etc., that are inferred from source, uh, from other sources using them or, or that is generated by the community, etc., etc. Though this, is, this can be used using SparkQL to, to find what, what is not working within the data. So we have kind of rich uh, range of constraints, single value constraints formats, for example, the distinct values, constraints, the symmetric constraints, et cetera, et cetera. The second is the data model and GX. I already explained it. 
And the third one is the use of Spark UL to kind of write, define, and verify logical conditions or constraints on about COVID-19 information. So this is the Spark UL endpoint of Wikidata. It has a query helper. You have here the space to write the Spark UL query. You can generate a short link here, and you can visualize it in a variety of uh, visualization types. You can download it, you can embed it in the programs, and you have even examples uh, of already existing uh, queries, sample queries that you can adapt for other purposes. Okay, so what we have implemented in Spark UL is two types of, uh, of logical constraints. First, we have developed logical constraints to validate relational statements, for example, uh, finding the common uses of the property, finding the inverse properties, finding the most uh, used cl classes that for uh, you the most uh, used class for the subject and the object of re re relations using a given property etc cetera, etc cetera. and the new fact that we have uh, we have deduced from our work is that spark ql can be used to validate statistical statements here we have some examples for example if the date of uh, for example a case is before 1 November 2019, it is false. For example, uh, the determination method of a clinical test should be a subclass of medical diagnosis. For example, the number of cases in a date Z plus one should be superior or equal to the one in date Z because the number of cases, the number of deaths, the number of recoveries, and the number of tests are cumulative. So th this is one type of, of how vali uh, the validation of uh, COVID-19 information can be done. The second one is that scholarly databases like COVID-19 can be used to find references that support a given statement in Wikidata. Here is the, 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 the process for doing that. Well, we, we, uh, well, we extract the inferen re referenced uh, Wikidata statements. We uh, identify the most relevant PubMed central publications using a kind of query. And th then we find the most relevant sentence for the claim in within the publications and then we align the permit central with wikidata id for each reference and then we add the obtained reference to wikidata okay so let's Who's move to results question? can i ask yes. a question about the validation um so am i understanding properly that uh that there are no restrict there are no validation restrictions on putting the data in to wikidata but then you have these tools and techniques for validating after the fact yes is that correct that's am i understanding that correct yes that's absolutely correct okay that's what we are doing and, and just as a compliment uh, sorry david you, ha you had finished uh, well, I have a yeah. follow-up. Sorry, that. sorry, go ahead. Um, and that is, okay, so if someone wants to make use of the Wikidata then, um, it would seem like there could be inconsistencies, for example, or uh, violations of those, uh, those constraints in the data at any, at any moment. Yes. Um, is that correct? We are, we are moving to, to it because I have the results and we tested oh, I see. all okay. the process. All right. And, okay, so uh, my question was going to be then, um, so how, how, would people, how would people who were trying to use the data 
uh, best deal with that. But uh, okay, you can defer yes. that question. Um, and Frank, you had a question too? Y yes, if you can just uh, move back to the previous slide. This one? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was wondering here. So you say uh, that you want to well, extra, uh, extract unreferenced statements, that is, find uh, the supporting sentence for claims. So you, you mean you, you look through the whole corpus for articles that would support a certain claim from another article? No. I'm not sure I, get, I got this. Because we, we, Wikidata is not uh, like the other uh, collaborative knowledge graphs. Any statement in Wikidata should be a a reference. This means that wh where the information mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. found. Yes. So in some cases, for a reason or another, the reference does not exist. They are not put in it. So I'm using this to find the reference. And if the reference does not exist, we remove the statements. And that's all. OK, you didn't, do not put any statement without reference, ever. Yes. Yes, uh, that, that's the concept. But OK, so I, I'm not sure I get it. Uh, you said so extract unreferenced like... statements. How, how would you have unreferenced statements? You, I mean, the statements are ex extracted from an article. So the reference is that article specifically where you, from which you have extracted the statement. OK, yeah, okay I will move back to the first slide. Uh, well, OK. So you see here, there is a statement here. And you see here, there are zero references. This mm -hmm. means that there is no reference about it. For example, here be below, just a little bit, there is the significant person for COVID-19, the person who, who uh, spread it, the whistleblower. So you have a reference that is showing it. OK. Uh, you get this? OK, but then you mean the unreferenced statements are not statements that you have created by analyzing core 19. It, it is you you browse other statements, we existing statements within the Wikidata to figure out if they are supported or not. Yes. We are just analyzing chord 19 using the, this bot because we have all other other stuff we have explained before that use chord 19 as well to to put information to Wikidata. Uh, so uh, in this bot, we just verify the statements. It is the validation process. Okay. So for example, that statement with zero references, uh, how how might that have gotten into the database? How well, could that have gotten? Just well, as an we example. have now for around uh, concerning COVID nineteen, we have around forty percent of unsupported statements. Okay, and and where did they come from typically? User contributions. Because oh, I uh, see. Yeah. Okay, got you. Yeah. Because okay. the the persons that the people that are doing that using bots, they are including the reference because right. it is okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. a requirement for approving the bots. Yeah. Okay. Very good. And I note that this requirement for having a reference uh, that aligns very well with the like Wikipedia requirement that uh, statements in Wikipedia have to have proper references too. So that's yes. interesting. Yeah, thank you. This is the main concept of the wiki. It is yeah. run by the same uh, nonprofit organization as well. It, it, they are both run by uh, Wikimedia Foundation. Right. Yep. Thanks. So let's. <laughs> thank you. So let's move to the results now. Okay. So as you see, thanks to the contributions of many people and of. Uh, tens of bots working on the stuff. We got a rich, rich, rich uh, COVID-19 node graph in Wikidata covering multiple facets of the disease. 
for example, you have here the humans, mainly the others uh, of publications or the people who are dead due to COVID-19, the diseases, the chemical compounds, for example, the drugs that are used for the treatment of COVID-19, the clinical trials, the vaccines, candidates, the treatments, the type of medical tests, uh, for example, the dashboards that are available across the internet, the scholarly articles, the disease outbreaks all over the world, the tracing apps, uh, the proteins that are involved in, in uh, SARS-CoV-2, the genes, the taxons that are hosting the SARS-CoV-2, the biological processes, mainly related to the pathogenesis of the disease, etc., etc. So it is a variety of content related to all the aspects ranging from computer science to biomedicine. Okay, the another aspects, and it is an important aspect, is that the multilinguality of the data is respected as well. So as you see here, there are many languages that are well represented. For example, the subjects of items having COVID as an object, an object are represented in a good way in English, but also in French, in German, in Spanish, in Chinese, in Arabic, in Japanese, and in Russian. The same of other types of relations related to COVID-19. As you see in the diagram E, there are 100 languages that are well that are have well, uh, good representation of COVID-19 information. Okay. Well, when we correlate the the output of uh, COVID nuki data counted with other factors, we see that the COVID-19 wiki, uh, wiki data content is high, highly correlated across languages with, with the language representation of COVID-19 in language editions of Wikipedia with the number of users using uh, speaking a given language, with the number of medical data labels, with the number of general medical Wikipedia articles, with the number of Wikipedia page views. And so it is kind of uh, uh, rich multilingual representation of COVID-19 facts due to a variety of factors ranging from demography to uh, the interest in online contributions and in computer support, uh, supported uh, collaborative works, such as uh, Wiki, uh, Wikipedia editing in medical contexts. Well, concerning the external databases aligned to Wikidata items in the context of COVID-19, we have seen that the DOI, the PubMed ID, the PubMed Central ID are well represented in Wikidata. And there are even, for example, clinicaltrials.gov uh, is well represented as well. So, and so it can be a good, a good, a good uh, re reference to, to use, uh, to uh, build a multi-source, uh, kind of multi-source, uh, computer applications for analyzing COVID-19 publications. And concerning disease, we have seen that the diseases and symptoms are where are linked in Wikidata are linked to MESH, to ICD-10, to UMLS metatistores, to the major biomedical semantic resources. Concerning the humans, they are linked to uh, VIAF, the authority control for uh, for library staff, WordCat as well, Library of Congress as well, authority control, the Freebase ID, 
the Twitter usernames, mainly for the people affected uh, by COVID-19. And concerning other types of stuff, for example, drugs, proteins, and films, they are, they are also linked to their, their uh, corresponding major uh, semantic database. Okay, for example, the drugs are they are link, linked to mass bank, to uh, splash, to uh, Q, to encyclopedia of genes and genomes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. For films, the internet movie database, etc. Okay, so we have talked before that the the Wikidata represents multiple facets of COVID-19. So we can make use of SparkQL to generate visualizations that integrates these types of aspects. Well, as you see here, you can see the interactions of proteins with, for example, some genes or with the human proteins. And this can explain the pathogenesis of the disease and can help uh, clinical uh, physicians take the best decision about how COVID-19 can be fought. Okay, so we, we can use all as well, you can, we can find as well the symptoms, represent them, and find the, the differential uh, diagnosis. This means that the medical conditions that have a good rate of shared symptoms. And this can be useful for a clinician to find, to eliminate that, uh, the, 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 the etiologies that are similar to COVID-19 and can be mistakenly considered as COVID-19. Okay, so, here, we can correlate between the mortality rate in a country and the number of cases. And as you see, it is inversely proportional. At the beginning, there is a peak, and then it is kind of decreases, and then it increases, but quite slightly. We also can, can infer the language, the uh, language, the age distribution of deaths related to COVID-19. And as we see here, it is superior to the normal distribution of age fatality, confirming the hypothesis of that uh, COVID-19 is, may, uh, is mainly affecting may, mainly the aged people. Okay. So ju just one question, Th these uh, graphics that you show, this data are extracted only from, from uh, what you have mined from the CORD-19 archive, or does it involve other data that's already in Wikidata? It does involve other data, because, because the, the, for example, this, it is inferred from the, the famous ca cases that are dead from COVID-19. The, the, the what, sorry? The, this graph, the second one, B, is inferred from the age of COVID-19 deaths. Yes. And we, with comparison with the deaths in general okay, that but, are okay. indexed in COVID-19. But these are not, the, this graph doesn't come from relationships that you have extracted from the articles themselves, where you would have found some evidence about the uh, number of deaths uh, uh, according to the age, for instance. No, or the moment, or the, these are uh, extracted from uh, statistical ones. But the the slide the, that is after it, it, it contains what, uh, some uh, information that is extracted from uh, Cord nineteen mm -hmm. from uh, scholarly publications. Let's um, see. Frank, Frank, I think I can clarify that, that the notable persons, I think those are people that are in Wikimedia, maybe from Wikipedia also. In other words, people that were reported in the media 
as having died from uh, COVID-19. It's not from scientific studies. Okay. No, it's okay. from uh, newspaper articles. Right. Okay, okay, okay. They are doing topic modelings. Uh, they are doing the kind of stuff using the RSS feeds. But the, this was slide that we are having here is mainly done using the COVID-19 publication analysis. For example, here, we have the common words and word combination, the engrams in the title of publications. You see here, for example, systematic review and meta-analysis. This means that there are plenty of reviews and meta-analysis related to COVID-19. For example, the cutaneous manifestation. There are, there are a study of the dermatology effects of COVID-19. For example, cohort study, recommendation, mental health, the case report, the impact, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, well, the second one is the co-occurrence of topics in publications. So you have here the, for example, COVID-19 is linked to SARS-CoV-2, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is re related to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, etc. Contact tracing is uh, related to the pandemic. The non-structural proteins uh, SARS-CoV-2 is linked to SARS-CoV-2, etc., etc. Et et so this this uh, uh, visualization is not inferred from scholarly publications. It is uh, inferred from news articles as well. It is about the bankruptcy. But I showed I showed here I showed it here because to uh, to explain how uh, how key data can represent a variety of things that are not represented in other uh, types of semantic graphs and to show how uh, making the development of knowledge graphs for COVID nineteen kind of open and collaborative can be beneficial to, to having uh, a complete or uh, a kind of absolute snapshot about all the aspects of COVID-19 pandemic and SARS-CoV-2. Okay, concerning the validation, you asked me before, what, what is the outcome of the relation uh, of uh, the validation process. Well, well, concerning the the logical constraints that are that are verifying relational statements, we have found some kinds ten percent of inconsistencies, and these inconsistencies are due to many, 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 many reasons. But the main ones that we have to keep in mind, and I think these are important even for future work about development of knowledge graphs. For example, there are 15% that are linked to eponym. And we have relations linked to eponym instead of the right concept. We have, for example, uh, uh, there are some relations are using big data and are mistakenly, mistakenly uh, having relations that are not quite related, that are mainly hypothetic uh, assumptions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have sometimes a subject-object inversion, uh, wrong property use. Etc. Etc. And the and this mean and the this the fact that we have identified this uh, it, uh, proves that validation methods can be useful to ameliorate the quality of relation statements in knowledge graphs, particularly in the context of COVID nineteen. Concerning the logical statements, the logical constraints to validate statistical statements, we have identified using the, it 
around 5,000 deficient uh, relation, uh, relations, uh, not relations, statistical statements. This means uh, 2, 000, around 2,000 gains uh, statements that are wrong. For example, 2,000, around 2,000 death statements that are wrong, around 200 recovery statements that are wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so what we propose from from our outcomes is that the we have to build an infrastructure for knowledge graph validation, where we can use the consistency rules the property statements and the data model represented in SHEX or other uh, RDF validation languages, for example, Shackle, Marvel, et cetera, et cetera. Well, as you see in the scheme here, with this can, the, the, these uh, methods, the three methods for the validation of uh, of RDF graphs or knowledge graphs can interact together, providing a good support for the data quality of knowledge graph. For example, here, the consistency rules implemented in SparkQL can be used to infer property statements and SheX. The SheX can can embed a, a SparkQL query that is representing a consistency rule. The SheX can be used to validate the knowledge graph. The property statement can use the, the, the knowledge graph by applying them using the SparkQL query as well. So it is a landscape, a, quite a... Uh, a landscape of various techniques for the validation of data, of linked data. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about the limitations here. The limitations. Well, several aspects of COVID-19 information can be more represented in other knowledge graphs. We are talking about the open research knowledge graph that is re that represents uh, kind of structured outcomes of scholarly publications, where the inclusions of this information is blocked by the CC0 license of Wikidata, as explained before. The second limitation is that several types of information are still unsupported by Wikidata. For example, the structured outcomes of COVID-19 scholarly publications. Several aspects are considered are more considered in textual resources such as Wikidata than in Wikidata and other knowledge graphs. For example, the COVID-19 pandemic in cruise ships or in naval ships. Okay, so we are finished. I have a quick question. I have a quick question there um, on that previous slide. What, what do you mean by um, structured outcomes? of COVID-19 scholarly publications? What do you mean by structured outcomes? Well, I can show, show it later because I can't I can enter to the site and, and show you how it, it are, they are structured. Okay, all right. Okay, I will come to it. Yeah, okay. understood. Okay, so <clears throat> just, uh, to finish, to, uh, to finish with, I'm proposing some kind of applications that can be uh, can be built using uh, COVID-19 knowledge graphs and particularly key data. For example, the first one is the multilingual topic modeling of social interactions. For example, the wiki data can be used to identify topics and to eliminate redundancy, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, uh, we do the LTA uh, process. And then 
we can use Wikidata once, you, once again to verify the, to find, to identify the scholarly publications that are dealing with the topics that are interesting people for the moment. And this can generate kind of recommendation system of scholarly publications for health professions and for the Ministry of Health. The second application is the knowledge-based system. For example, we can use the uh, Wikidata information for, rec for the recommendation, for, recommend for, for example, uh, saying to a patient if he is, he has a great, a great kind of high probability that he had contracted COVID-19 or not. For example, for education, to, see, to say to people uh, to, for example, to build a game that uses COVID-19 structured information to educate people, what is COVID-19, how it works, uh, what is the features of the disease, et cetera, et cetera. The conclusion, well, the conclusion. So Wikidata and other now collaborative multidisciplinary knowledge graph can create more efficiently a semantic database for COVID-19. Despite this, their slight limitations, collaborative multidisciplinary knowledge graphs like Wikidata can return interesting findings about COVID-19 due to the integration of COVID-19 multidisciplinary information with non-COVID-19 information. Due to the interesting coverage of COVID-19 in Wikidata, it can be used for a variety of applications using semantic web tools. So these are the works that have, we have developed for COVID-19. We have one paper published in Journal of Biomedical Informatics. We have two preprints in Zenodo and a preprint by another team working on genomic stuff related to COVID-19. And the other team have, has also uh, published a paper in a life journal. Okay, so thank you very much. We can so go to question now. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, it was very interesting. And I am very intrigued about the use of Wikidata for this purpose. It, for one thing, it seems like it has a big benefit of enabling crowdsourcing and obviously uh, public use of the data. That's really interesting. I also noticed the requirement for a CC0 license or public domain uh, information. That's interesting. And I, I certainly understand the rationale for that because trying to manage a lot of different licenses would be, I'm sure, really, really, really hard. That I think points out the need for the community in general to go to open licensing for uh, scholarly research uh, results. So I'm, I'm glad that that topic came up. Um, one question that I do have is, um, how has this uh, Wikidata approach to COVID-19 uh, data, how has it been used so far in COVID-19 research? Are you aware of any ways that it's being used yet? Well, there is the work of uh, Frank Michel, the code on the web, the COVID of the web uh, knowledge graph that is uh, using the entities, uh, the labels of the entities related to COVID-19 to annotate uh, sentences within the COVID-19 corpus. This, this one I, I know very well. Well, there are some other works, but they are still in progress. Yeah. For example, for example, we have kind of a dashboard for uh, for tracking uh, the the vaccines, say safety, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, based on Wikidata. Is that uh, they are uh, if a vaccine is rich in uh, the the stage three or two or one etc cetera, etc cetera. 
uh, where there are dashboards that are used as statistical data to track the da daily evolution of the disease of the outbreak in some countries. So we have kind of plenty, plenty, plenty of stuff. The, these stuff are mainly used in SparkQL to integrate the data and kind of give visualizations that are explaining COVID-19. Can I ask Excellent. a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> so regarding provenance, you mentioned that as in, Wikidata uses uh, references, which are typically just pointers to text, right? There. Yeah. Uh, so do you know, or are you aware of any work that is trying to turn that into data as well? In other words, instead of having text, you have other statements or uh, sets of statements that are, for instance, in prov uh, vocabulary or some other vocabulary to support whatever statement uh, it's being applied to. Well, like micro assertions sort of thing? Well, yeah, well, there, there are a number of proposals for how to record uh, the provenance yeah. data. So the, the, one of the more popular yeah. ones is the Provo vocabulary, which can be used in many ways too. It's a generic vocabulary. So, but yeah. anything that will turn that, ideally it should be Wikidata as well, right? So the, uh, there the is something in Wikidata that can answer to this. Well, the reference is represented in the form of triples. So the object of that triples can be a, a record in Wikidata for a, a publication or scholarly publication. The, when you go to the item of these publications, you can have information about it. So you can have uh, the main topics of it. You can but have uh, pointing to a references. publication, pointing to a text publication is a step forward. But it's uh, if you want to automate or or do any kind of reasoning on that, that will stop as soon as you reach a PDF or something like that. So ideally, yeah. you, you want to extract whatever relevant data is in the publication until uh, well, well, that can be When amenable. it comes to full text, it is uh, it's difficult. But luckily, the COVID-19 uh, data sets is available in text format that can be processed by, uh, by computers. So we can generate. Yeah, but Ideally, you, you would process the claims and stuff that's in the papers to make them Wikidata statements. Yes. But what, what, once we, uh, we are doing that Wikidata statements, we are not going to the, to the main text to, uh, to see that that is the sentence where, where the claim is uh, is well, that would be the reference of that the Wikidata reference. say. Yeah, yeah. We are just but putting still. the reference. But if we, 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 uh, we, are, we like to do that, we can do that on the paper itself. And that's why I talked about, about the annotation, the semantic annotations of relations and not of items and entities. And this is a promising, promising field of work for semantic annotations, I, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, a related question uh, is that you, you use NLP tools to annotate uh, the, the free text from publications. So did you use any standard vocabularies actually uh, enable uh, uh, the semantic linkage uh, uh, across different data sets? Uh, sounds like your NLP tools just gen generate term level or a natural language, uh, natural language, uh, language level annotations rather than uh, provide, for example, standard vocabularies, for example, uh, uh, in clinical domain, we use normal CT concept to represent conditions using X norm to represent clinical drugs, et cetera. So I, I understand um, maybe you, you had concerns on uh, uh, license uh, issues. But, but my understanding is that if uh, standard vocabularies can be used to 
uh, represent those semantic annotations that will be potentially expand your semantic linkage across different data sets. So uh, you did mention you, you uh, used mesh terms. That's a, a good thing. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, 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 do, do you uh, plan to use any uh, standard vocabularies to actually uh, uh, represent those semantic annotations in your data sets? I think that's a question. Sorry, I didn't uh, hear very well the question. He's asking if you are, do you plan to use or do you use uh, any standard vocabularies, medical vocabularies, such as what SNOMED or LOINC or RxNorm? RxNorm. Yes. Do you use any of those standard vocabularies or do you plan to? In the well, they are. They are really matched to uh, the standard vocabularies, actually. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What was that? Well, the the items are matched, are, li are linked to items in the standard vocabularies. Is nomad in mesh in your MLS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they are already aligned. Okay. All right. So they're already linked to, to those standard vocabularies. Yes. But the main focus is on the all linked open data data sets and uh, semantic resources. Right. Okay, this is great. the main, uh, the main re reference we are building the thing upon. Okay, so there is one question about what is the structured representation of uh, of the outcomes I just show here. Here is the RKG. So as you see here, there is the title and the contributions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and there is here the outcomes represented. So you see here that the this paper said that the main incubation period for COVID-19 is seven days. The the may the <laughs> this, uh, the location is Singapore. The confidence interval with uh, level with a confidence level of ninety five percent is between one forty five and two forty eight, and that's what what uh, we call the structured uh, the structured outcomes of scholarly publications. Okay, it is uh, the abstract represented in the form of RDF clips. Right. I wasn't aware that these were available. So I, I suppose it's certain publishers that are offering this? No, yeah. it is the work of the IB. It is a German uh, team that is working on it. Ah, okay. Okay, right. Good. Interesting. Yeah. So we are thinking that this can be used for a variety of stuff. For example, of doing systematic reviews, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of doing Excel uh, access, et cetera, SQL, et cetera, you just have this data set in their data format. And you, ha you have just to enter some SparkQL code and uh, have all the results for a systematic review, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And the results, the, the SparkQL query, queries can be embedded. And then when something new is added, uh, the, all the results of the systematic review is updated, et cetera, et cetera. OK, very good. Well, we're way over time. But uh, is there, are there any other final questions for, for our speaker today? Uh, actually, ju just a comment. Uh... Maybe I connect to my cam at the same time. Um, yeah, the work on on the on the relationships, extracting the relationships within from the papers is really interesting. And I was wondering how this could uh, somehow connect with the work we have done on arguments, which is slightly different. So 
uh, you know, uh, we, made in from, we have this core 19, 9 entities knowledge graph, and it's actually complemented by another one, which is the argumentative knowledge graph. So in this one, terms are uh, identified, well, disambiguated against uh, UMLSIDs, and we have this structure, structuring of arguments, like this paper states that uh, this drug has an effect on uh, this symptom. And um, the, 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 the thing is to build a, a graph of such arguments where you can say that this argument supports or attacks another argument. And, uh, but still the arguments remain sentences. So we, we identified the terms uh, and we link them to UMLS IDs, but we do not infer triples from, from that, like the, the examples you have shown, where you say uh, uh, you, you use relationships, actual predicates to, to, to make triples out of these statements. And it could be, uh, I think, amazing to, to have this representation both of relationships translated to triples, plus some sort of reification of those and saying that and, and adding this relationships of attack or, or support uh, of arguments. And if we can get here, you know, we, we have a, another level of abstraction, we can, which can be even more interesting, I think, where for, for clinicians, where they are trying to figure out some evidence or something of something or, or find a counter example of something and so on. So that probably good leads. I don't know how to handle that from now, but there's lots of things to do here. Yeah, very, very true. Yes. Uh, there are, there is also the nature of statement we have in Wikidata that can might be interesting in your case. This means that to which extent the statement is correct. For example, a COVID-19 causes, uh, for example, has a symptom, for example, uh, digestive disorders, for example. This statement is added a qualifier nature of statement that is rarely. This means that it rarely causes kind of uh, gastric disorders, etc., etc. And this kind of uh, like uh, uh, qualifiers can give more, more, more value to uh, to the shape of the knowledge graph and how we can be confident when processing a knowledge graph. Because in medicine, there is not zero or one. The, it is kind of fuzzy logic. Mm -hmm. So we have sometimes rarely, sometimes quite usually, sometimes it is 50-50, etc., etc. There is uh, Dr. Daniel Mitchen, who is a contributor to the project that made several comments on the chat. So it is true that sometimes Wikidata, Wikidata refuses some statements from the beginning. For example, if the property, uh, if the, the object is of a property should be an item and the user gives a kind of a string, it, it will not be accepted. Mm, right. So there is kind of intrinsic kind of uh, validations of the data from the beginning, but this is minor. For example, uh, if the shape is uh, is respected, uh, uh, wrong information can be leaked, and it right. is later on. Uh, right, it's more syntactic validation. Yes, David, just a suggestion. Uh, you will copy these uh, links and stuff from the chat into the doc. Oh, um, let me see if I because can... it gets lost once you oh, close okay. the. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I'll get it then. Okay. Another one is that the sentence can be embedded uh, in the reference as uh, a, a, a qualifier to the reference. But this is, uh, well, it is not used as it should be. It is used on hundreds of references. So the main practice is the, that they put the reference without the sentence. May I say something before we go again? Uh, just 
just a point to make there, is that uh, with regards to uh, this issue of uh, essentially, at one point you have to trust uh, the information to use it for something, which I think is the root of what David was asking earlier. When you get a statement, you can look at certain uh, logical constraints and so on, but often in the end, it will depend very much on the, on the source. Uh, where did this come from? Or it's, sometimes it's an organization and so on. Uh, true that in many cases it has to do with uh, what was the method that was used to extract uh, this compound, for example, to this death. But in the end, there's always a component that has to do with, with the author of the uh, statement. And unfortunately, uh, Wikidata at this point, although it does have the information in the Wikibase, it does not make the author of the statement directly available as Wikidata. Right, mm. so I, I see that as, as a, is a uh, Achilles heel, let's put it this way, in completely supporting this process and uh, I've actually uh, discussed this a little bit with uh, Danny Vandrichik uh, about, about that. There are a number of reasons, practical reasons, why uh, you don't do that in general for Wikidata. But in cases like this, I would argue that it would be useful to have this uh, explicitly as data. Daniel is saying something here. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, there, there are ways. Well, work but you have, you can have the history. You can yeah. ser search yeah, the history and I find understand. other history. There, there are all automated tools complementary that you can extract that information. I know that. But it's separate from Wikidata, right? Yes. It's not integrated. So ideally, it should be all in the same model. Yes, that's so maybe point that's to be part considered. of what should be added as part of the annotations then. Yeah, yeah. There, I, I guess there are a number of uh, approaches to that. Yep. Uh, and create. Uh, so it, it, in some sense, you will be duplicating the information that's already in the database because Obviously, from the history, Wikidata, the Wikibase does know who the author is and so on. Not to mention the fact that you have identity problems in, the, in this uh, or issue, right? Uh, and right. there are many reasons for many statements that when people do not want to be identified or it's even dangerous in some cases. Uh, but here, uh, I think there are cases where it's useful to have that information explicit. Uh, so. yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we're way over time, so I think we should close here. But again, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.